welcome to the 26th episode of Reinventing School. Uh, today we're doing something a little different from what we usually do because the virus has caused such a pandemic that the impact on school now and probably in the future looks to be enormous. And I want to better understand, so what exactly is a virus and a pandemic and a coronavirus? And and is this different? Are we going to be living with this for the next 20 years? What happens if there's a vaccine? There's all these questions that are kind of floating around. And some of it ends up being, I, I guess, for all of us, very local, because the question is, should I send, send my kids to school? Or I'm a teacher. Should I go to school? Do I want to be doing this? Uh, or maybe it's time to retire or find some other job, as if there's another job in the marketplace right now. So there's a lot of questions spinning around. And and um, I really wanted to have people who understand this from a scientific and medical point of view, but also from a public health point of view. So, um, so you're going to hear a lot of technical terms, and you're going to hear me keep saying, well, I don't understand what that is. So don't feel as though, to the audience, that this is something that's going to be difficult to understand. If you're in sixth or seventh grade, you should be able to follow this conversation, um, which you know, for me is about the level of my scientific education or knowledge. So we'll start there. Uh, so uh, T. Stagosh, tell us where you are and about yourself. And you've had some exciting adventures at the White House, I think, and also in Washington, D.C., as well as Colorado, in addition to what you're doing now. Yeah, um, I'm Dr. T. Stagosh. I'm an internal medicine physician and a CDC-trained epidemiologist. Uh, I, I'm the former chief medical officer of the state of Colorado, and I've also uh, been appointed previously to the U.S. Community Preventive Services Task Force, uh, which is the advisory committee to the CDC. Uh, so I've been in public health for a long time and um, have actually worked on pandemic responses previously as well. Cool. That's great. Thank yeah. you. Glad you're here. And, and I just, I do want to add, I'm currently um, the senior medical director for Grand Rounds, uh, which is a digital health company that works with Fortune 500 companies across the U.S. Um, and in that role, I'm helping advise them on how to deal with the pandemic. What is digital health? Digital health is really um, using technology um, to help promote health. So it could be apps, it could be using um, phone, it could be using video, um, but it, it's a, a variety of different ways to reach people, even if um, they can't get, for example, in-person care, which actually did happen during the pandemic um, around March, April. A lot of people couldn't get in to see their doctors and um, our company provides a virtual guidance and, and clinical care to a lot of um, employees of companies across the U.S. Pretty good. Thank you. Um, Glenn, tell us about where you are and what you've been up to for the past several decades, right? Yeah, actually <laughs> right. So uh, my name is Glenn Rawl. I'm uh, a scientist, a PhD scientist at the Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, I've been, as Howie uh, alluded to, I've been a faculty member here for 25 years. Um, in addition to my faculty uh, role, um, I'm also the chief academic officer. But I think pertinent to today's talk, my lab's interest is in understanding how viruses replicate and how those viruses cause disease, most specifically cause disease in humans. Okay. Um, so that's what my research is. My specific interest is in how viruses gain access and infect the cells in the, in the brain, in the central nervous system. But it's globally that field is referred to as viral pathogenesis, how viruses cause disease. Good. Thank you. Glad you're here. Steve, tell us about you. So uh, I'm Steve Taffet. I'm a professor of microbiology and immunology at Upstate Medical University uh, at Syracuse, New York. And I have been uh, doing research in immunology as well as cardiovascular research uh, for a stint uh, for the last 40 years. Uh, in immunology, it's mostly been the innate immune system, which doesn't have to do with antibodies or T cells, but how we just simply have an ability to respond to pathogens. 
Uh, it's, it's actually probably very important with this virus. Um, and um, mostly uh, these days I do a lot of administrative work. I uh, do teaching of immunology to medical students, graduate students, and, um, and help uh, keep this place running uh, as I have phased out my research and spend more time advising and, and helping people. Good, thank you, glad you're here. Uh, so I'm gonna start at the most basic level. What's a virus? Tista, do you want to do it or you want me to give it a crack? Go for it. Go for it. So <laughs> um, a virus is, we don't define viruses as living or not living. They are, think of them like a seed. That if you just put a seed onto a tabletop, it's not going to do anything. Um, it won't grow. It'll sit there and it can sit there for some period of time. In order for a seed to turn into some sort of plant, it needs... Uh, the right amount of dirt and water and sunlight. Viruses are similar to seeds in that they don't do anything on their own. In order for them to be able to multiply and to cause disease, although that's not their primary objective, um, they need to grow inside of cells. So every living entity is comprised of, of uh, different cell types and viruses grow inside of those cells. Um, every virus um, has at least two things in common. One of them is that it has genetic material that can either be DNA or it can actually be RNA. And that's actually true for the coronaviruses. It's made up just of RNA. It is, has no DNA phase to it whatsoever. Um, and the other thing is because viruses travel from cell to cell or from host to host, they have to be protected during that journey. And so all viruses are have coats, as it were. We actually do refer to them as coats or envelopes. They're things that protect that nucleic acid or that, um, that genetic information um, as, it, as that virus particle travels from one host to another or from one cell to another. How was that, Tista? I think that's great. Uh, right. and, and more simply, what I, I would say to my eight-year-old daughter is it's a germ that, you know, really, um, can make you sick and, and, and you can pass it from one person to another. It's smaller than a cell. I know that because if it's gonna be inside a cell, then it's gonna be smaller than the cell, right? Yes, so much smaller. How big is a cell and how big is a virus and how can you put that in any kind of relative term so I might understand it? Um, a thousand fold, well, a cell, a normal, the cells I work with are 10 microns across uh, one, 10 micrometers um, across. So I know a millimeter, it's smaller and than so a millimeter. And so one hundredth of a millimeter. Um, and uh, uh, the, I know that uh, viruses by definition can get through a filter of, of one hundredth of that uh, at least. Um, so. Okay, so, there, so we have a sense of how tiny. Now, when we talk about a virus entering your body, are we talking about one little seed, if you will? Or are we talking about a whole, like four of them? Are we talking about a million of them? Like when you say that you've caught a virus, almost like catching a ball, how many are you actually catching? Depends on the virus. Yeah, it's actually a, it's a, it is a really interesting, almost philosophical question because there are lots of different types of virus, right? There's the common cold, there's this pandemic virus that's a coronavirus, there's HIV, um, and each of them, think of them like maybe different, I don't know, flavors of ice cream. They're all viruses, but they all grow in different cell types and they all cause different sorts of disease. And likewise, the number of particles, that, the number of in, individual viruses that you need in order to become infected by that um, by that virus varies from virus to virus. Almost certainly it's not a single particle um, because you've got all sorts of protective mechanisms, at least from thinking at it from a perspective of a human that block the ability of these viruses to gain a foothold and be able to infect you. Just things like dead skin on your surface or mucous membranes, all of these are evolutionarily designed traps that help to keep all germs, to Tista's point, not just viruses, but bacteria as well, from being able to get 
into individual cells and initiate an infection. So almost certainly an infectious dose is on the order of tens to thousands, not likely to be a single virus particle. Okay, good. Thank you. That's, uh, you this is helping me to sort of understand this. And, um, and in the case of coronavirus, it's very likely in some sort of droplet of a fairly significant size, because if a, a, a few virus particles landed in a mucous membrane, there's things in mucous membranes that just aren't great for viruses. So it probably is, is a, a bolus of virus in a droplet. It's a what? A, 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 a package of virus in a droplet that got spit out while someone was talking, speaking, uh, uh, coughing. Okay. So if I started laughing or singing or whatever the thing is, and I'm setting droplets in the air, one of those droplets contains four viruses, a thousand viruses. Like, give me a sense of what that might be. 50,000 viruses. Oh, really? Okay. A lot. Now, you said coronavirus. Um, are there different kinds of viruses? Apparently, yes, because they deal with different kinds of cells. But what's a coronavirus? Well, have you seen the yeah. picture of this virus? Yeah, it kind of looks like a starship of some sort. Yeah, the, well, yeah. I think in the early EMs, it looked like it had electron micrograph pictures. Thank it looked you. like it had a crown. Like the corona when the moon is in front of the, the sun during an eclipse. Are, are there lots of coronaviruses or is this one the coronavirus? Like how, how does that? It's also a really relevant question because there are lots of coronaviruses. So the ones that people might have heard about before this one um, were the SARS coronavirus, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, and then one that was much more deadly than SARS, but ha happily, fortunately, infected far fewer people, was one called MERS, M-E-R-S, which was Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus. Both of those were coronaviruses like this current pandemic strain. And even more importantly, there are other coronaviruses that are just part of the normal range of infections that people end up getting, like common colds. So many of us have probably already been exposed to coronaviruses before, maybe not this particular pandemic strain, but similar strains. And that becomes really important immunologically because you might have even though, they're, even though they're a different virus than this pandemic strain, they're similar enough to the one that's causing a pandemic that if you've made an immune response to any of those viruses from the past, that might provide a little bit of protection uh, for this current pandemic strain. We don't know that yet for sure, but that certainly seems plausible. So Tista, you said germ. So mm -hmm. let's back up a little bit. You have bacteria are bacteria germs and viruses and germs I remember are different things, although I certainly couldn't explain why or how they're different. So help. Well, I would say germs are organisms that can make us sick. Okay. Um, and then bacteria are one type and viruses are a, another type. Um, in, in medicine, we, um, we have more tools to combat bacteria. So we have um, antibiotics. So you think about, you know, you get strep throat that's caused by a bacteria and you can take an antibiotic for it. Um, in, with viruses, we, we typically have less tools in our toolkit. Um, there are some antiviral drugs, but we don't have the range of um, medicines. Um, that we do with bacteria, generally speaking. Now, there's good bacteria and bad bacteria, right? Because you have good bacteria in your gut. Are there good viruses and bad viruses? Yeah, almost. Well, there probably aren't good viruses in terms of ones that benefit the health of an organism, a human, a plant, a, a mouse, a, a pig. Um, but there certainly are viruses that um, are almost invisible. They don't end up causing any disease and therefore we may not know that we are infected by them. Um, so yes, there are, there are plenty of disease neutral, as it were, 
uh, viruses that are out there. But they're a good bacteria. It's not new. They're they're good bacteria. You, bad, bad you bacteria. really can't survive well without bacteria. They're okay. they're they're an important part of you. Okay, so bacteria can be our friends, but it's unlike the virus is going to be your friend. I right? actually don't know that that it couldn't be true. We just may not know yet. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So there's this knowledge problem, right? And I, I, so let me pull back a little bit. So somehow everybody knows a tiny bit now about viruses and can, and most seven-year-olds can say coronavirus and have some sense that it's not a good thing. Um, but it, it's not, only a human thing. And I think the seven-year-old probably knows something about, well, there's animals and some animals get infected by some viruses, but not others. But somehow this one maybe was a, an animal virus in China that suddenly became a human virus. So this sounds a lot like a comic book. Like, how did it pick up those superpowers? Like, what? huh? What is that all about? Um, I can start on this one. Um, I think some viruses and, and coronaviruses are, are one of those um, can, um, ha can mix their genetic material with each other and come up with a new version of itself, almost like a superhero version of the virus. Um, flu can do this, the influenza virus, um, uh, and some coronaviruses can do this too. So um, not all um, viruses um, are specific to humans. Some are specific to bats, some are specific to, you know, whatever other animal. And if um, the human version and the bat version get together, mix their genetic material a bit, you might come up with a combination um, that is uh, infectious to humans, but um, the human immune system hasn't seen before. And I'll let Glenn and Steven elaborate. Well, I just want to say that there's so many bats in the world, way more bats than I actually realized there were. I think a third <laughs> of all mammalian species are bats. Um, and they have a lot of virus infections. They have a lot of endemic viruses, meaning they're there all the time. They don't do the bats much harm. And when they've screened a lot of them, there's the capability of those viruses in the bats. Some of these can infect human cells. And so the potential for these bat viruses to jump under the right circumstances is almost always there. Uh, bats are filled with viruses and no one knows exactly why. Uh, it may have to do with their metabolism, but... Um, so two points on both of these, on, on this discussion so far, that it's believed that this coronavirus pandemic strain originated from bats. And Tista is absolutely right that there may be circumstances in which a little mutation, nothing overt, but just a small change in that genetic component that makes up the virus, now suddenly makes it that much more hospitable to be able to grow in a different strain and a different host. Like instead of growing in a bat, now it can grow in a human. That certainly is possible. But there's another possibility here too, which is, and I think it's the reason why a lot of virologists are at their core also environmentalists, because as we begin to get closer and closer to these species that we would normally not be present in uh, or would normally overlap with, now we run the risk that we not only are sharing the environment, but we're also sharing whatever infections they might have. And so these viruses can hop from one species to another simply because we're now existing within their environment, right? So um, the more you know, we break in, the more deforestation occurs, the more climate change occurs, and now you end up having mosquitoes, for example, which are also rampant carriers of viruses, so that now they're uh, their life, their, um, their habitat now increases because the, the earth gets warmer and they can move further away from the poles, the more likely, uh, or sorry, the, from the equator, the more likely it is that we're going to come in contact with these organisms that share or that have viruses that are infectious for humans. That doesn't sound good. So no. the obvious question is, so let's go back to sort of viruses' greatest hits. So I'm assuming that 
we had this 1918, is it? What's the year? Um, 1918. And, and that was not a bat. It was a rat. Do I have that right? No, probably a pig. Uh, a pig. From, okay, good. From All right. flu. Okay. And then what was the like big one before that? And what caused it? Well, smallpox would be a viral infection that was uh, exceptionally deadly for a very, very long time. But I don't know what it might have jumped from. It may have been in humans for tens of thousands of years. Um, we've eradicated smallpox in, in one of the great success stories of vaccines. What about before that? Or what about others that, have, yeah. that are famous, if you will? The, the famous ones tend to be flu um, that are pandemics. Okay. Um, 2009, there was a pandemic. Um, it wasn't as severe. Um, it was a flu pandemic and, and that one, remember uh, they called it the swine flu at the time. Yeah. It's H1N1 uh, flu. And there was a was. bird flu of some sort. There's a bird flu that they were worried about. Um, but they're, um, they're basically viruses that are just somehow either that, you know, mix with an animal or, you know, they cross species and the human immune system just has never seen it before. And um, that makes us more susceptible and it also makes it spread more easily. And I think, you know, in the 21st century with the amount of travel that we do, um, it just accelerates the spread compared to say 1918. So, and, and please remember that we're undergoing this type, maybe not pandemic because it doesn't spread human to human, but spreading from animals to human, we have a lot of arboviruses that are viruses uh, that infect uh, mosquitoes and then can jump to humans when the mosquitoes bite. Uh, dengue probably infects hundreds of millions of people. Um, and we heard about Zika a few years ago um, and uh, another bad one down in the in more tropical areas with chikagunya. Uh, uh, these things spread through human populations by means of mosquitoes and uh, are, are actually very serious diseases in the populations that get them. We don't hear about it here because we don't have those mosquitoes. But as things get warmer, are we going to start seeing dengue fever and things like that? In, in South other... Florida and Texas, for sure, right now, a little that, bit. That's new or newer? Newer. So are we in a golden age of viruses? That's kind of what I'm here. Is this accelerating to a point where it's like, oh, well, I remember the pandemic of 2020. It wasn't nearly as bad as the pandemic of 2022. I mean, are we going to be talking like that? I hope not. Well, I mean, I think so. We've talked about now a couple of different types of viruses, right? The coronaviruses, which are the ones that are causing the current pandemic. And then how you mentioned the 1918, which is influenza. It's another different type of virus that also often causes pandemics. But I think one that uh, maybe some of your listeners will be familiar with, and I've, I've actually argued that I'm a guy in my 50s that I've lived through two pandemics. The other of which was HIV-1, a completely different kind of virus transmitted in a different way. But this also resulted in a pandemic of sorts. And this is a virus that, like what we were talking about, how viruses can jump from species, this originated in monkeys and made its way. It causes something called simian immunodeficiency in monkeys and variations, mutations that Tista talked about were able to make this virus now be able to be infectious in humans. So there are lots of different types of viruses that kind of ebb and flow um, over time. This pandemic, we're, I'm surprised that we're surprised. These pandemics occur from different sorts of virus families every century or so, right? The 1918 flu is almost to the mark 100 years ago. And um, so I don't know if it's accelerating, but I think our capacity to detect them and to be able to diagnose them and differentiate them and say, ah, oh, this is that kind of a coronavirus versus that kind of a coronavirus, that certainly has improved. So because our awareness has improved, there may be the appearance that there are more of these pathogens that are circulating. I do think that's true, but I think that this has been part of the 
the struggle of being a living thing, having to contend with the germs that are outside in the environment. This has been part of the, the human story all along. Doesn't it seem as though this sort of caught us by surprise? Completely by surprise. Okay. When as so, virologists, when we were asked, should I be scared of Zika virus? Should I be scared of Ebola virus? Most of us, and Tista, you can either sign on to this or not, but most of us who are card carrying virologists were like, no, this is not what I'm worried about. And then if they said, what are you worried about? Our answer almost always was an influenza pandemic. An same, influenza Tista? Pandemic. Yes, uh, coronavirus, um, you know, there was the SARS, um, you know, outbreak in 2001 and then and MERS, which was mentioned earlier, but not really on our radar. I mean, everybody was preparing for a flu pandemic and that's what we thought was coming. And, you know, flu has historically caused pandemics, um, the 1918 one being one of the more famous ones. So we were all focused on flu and a coronavirus really sort of took us by surprise. There are thousands of influenza scientists or virologists. There are probably a few dozen coronavirologists by comparison. So we place the wrong bet? Uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. I see your point here. Sounds uh, like it. Well, we, it seems that's, that that may be that may be true. I, I think all of the effort and time that's focused on flu is certainly worth it. This is an infection that still, even to this year, the reason why you know everyone needs to get their flu shot, even though we're all focused on the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, this, the flu, is a virus that causes great um, human suffering and death year upon year upon year and barely makes the headlines because it's just part of our you know normal, this is just you know, what it does. So I don't think that we placed the wrong bet. I do think there was a lot of surprise, to Tista's point, um, that it was a coronavirus um, that has had such, um, you know, kind of gravitas and, and has had such durability as it's made its way across the population because SARS and MERS, both of these previous coronavirus pandemics, burned out fairly quickly. So it's 1900. Actually, look at the span from 1900 to now. Have we managed to kill more people with this one virus than all of those flu things put together? Or has flu been much more? De I don't have any sense of scale. So understand that um, infectious disease kills a lot more people than you realize. It's just happening all the time. So in Africa, I think that, that the number of people killed by TB is probably way greater than flu or uh, COVID-19. It's there. Tuberculosis is, is killing people. Malaria kills uh, a lot of people. Um, that, that this is a particular pandemic. It's spreading in across the world it's because we don't have any immunity to it. But it's flu is an average of what, 30 to 30,000 a year in the United States. So in the last 10 years, it would have been 300,000 in the last hundred years, I, I, you know, you can take a guess with the numbers of people are, are higher now. So, but, um, and we still have one drug that works against some strains of flu, a vaccine that's maybe 50% effective and maybe 40% of people or 30% of people will take. Um, so we really don't have good answers against flu and that's here every year. Hmm. Well, I just for fun, I pulled up and not fun might not be the perfect word, Africa check, um, which has some pretty good Africa stats and lower respiratory tract infections and diarrhea together are about 18% of deaths in 2016. It's from probably viral diarrhea. Oh, there we are. All right. Malaria and TB each are about 5%. Um, Heart disease about five, strokes about four, cirrhosis is about two. Um, road injuries, surprisingly, is only three, because if you've driven around any of the African, larger African cities, that seems alarmingly low, but we're not going to worry about that. Um, so, it, but there's a connection between viruses and some of these other things you're talking about then. There's a connection between viruses and diarrhea, for example. Oh, 
Okay. Yes, um, viruses cause diarrheal illnesses and um, you know, the environment as, as Glenn mentioned earlier is, is linked um, quite strongly to how well a virus can spread. So some of the biggest public health gains that we had in the US in the early 20th century were related to fixing environmental issues like uh, improving clean, you know, getting people clean water um, reduced infant mortality due to diarrheal illnesses more than almost anything else that we did. It was, it was that or draining swamps so that we didn't have mosquitoes. Um, you know, so the reduction in infectious diseases, um, the environment that you create can play a great role because certain environments foster more, uh, more germs to, to grow. So when you were, Tista, when you were walking around in the state government world of Colorado, and you said public health might have a flu problem, might have, did anybody like, it's like, here goes Tista again, or what, like, what was, like, what is the environment in government? Because they're the ones who at least exert some authority on schools, um, but they certainly exert authority on others as well. So you come in, are you looked at as an alarmist? Do people really sit down and listen? Do you always have some disease you're talking about? So they're like, oh man, I hear she comes again. Like, how does it, what does it feel to be you in that environment? Because, and there's 50 of you, right? In different right. places, right? Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's tough. I mean, the pandemic has obviously made us much more visible, um, but I think we're often facing uh, the behemoth of healthcare and, and people think of health care, but they don't think of prevention, which is what public health looks at, right? They wanna prevent you from getting that virus. They wanna drain the swamp before you get the mosquito to bite you. And um, you know, if something's not there, you forget about it um, or you don't value its importance until it doesn't work. So um, you know, all of these gains that I mentioned uh, such as, you know, we had a huge reduction in infant mortality because of clean water. Um, people don't think of clean water. They think of going to the doctor's office. Um, but public health brought you clean water. Um, and, and you don't remember that they're there. Um, and um, so a lot of times it was hard to get attention compared to, you um, you know, how much are we spending on healthcare services? Um, but there was often this argument, if you, if you spend more on public health and prevention and planning for a pandemic or creating an environment where, uh, you know, health happens, um, then you would naturally spend less on healthcare. So there's that tension um, that it always sort of existed. Pre-pandemic, I'm, a high school student. Mm -hmm. My memory of discussing public health in anything like what we're talking about here. I don't know. We probably did an hour in all of high school, maybe two. Mm -hmm. Steve, we went to the same high school. What's your memory? I, I have no memory of actually discussing public health. And I took AP bio. <laughs> Nothing. Yep. So, yep. yeah. Um, I mean, I remember talking about like, I remember like, I'll go beyond that. I don't remember discussing it as a bio major much in uh, college. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> With that. It probably With didn't. Some of this came up in virology in grad school and, and but even there, public health isn't, uh, I, I guess, uh, Glenn, you, you were probably a, a micro student or something do you remember discussing it much even in, as far as grad school i don't yeah i know as, as you guys were all talking i thought this was not like when i was a micro when i was a graduate student our classes were very much on the mechanics of how viruses replicate how you know how germs grow how the immune response deals with this it was very much on an individual cell or an individual person kind of level this idea, the kinds of things that Tista works on, epidemiology, how viruses or germs of any kind spread within populations, how public health measures help to mitigate or reduce some of those risks. 
was uh, depressingly not part of those conversations and so, hugely impactful. I was very fortunate because the first course I had in grad school was uh, taught, uh, I don't know if you know Joel Baseman, uh, he's probably, he retired a few years back, but he was, um, he, he was very interested in host parasite interactions. So we learned immunology and um, microbiology from that standpoint as an interaction, but on the individual level, mm -hmm. from a person and and what might how that interaction of a of a parasite, meaning any bacteria or or fungi or or virus, with the whole being. Uh, so th there was a more broad, but that was still an individual. It wasn't a population. Right. I don't so remember anything with a population yeah and and even i went through medical school and didn't know about public health uh, till my fourth year and and really that's what it is it's focusing on the health of populations so it's looking at how do i keep an entire community healthy um whether that's from a virus or a bacteria or from you know getting killed in a car accident um you know what what are the things that we can do to protect the entire community as a whole. So I've got this giant thought bubble here and it says, OMG. We'll be <laughs> right back. So there's a look at some of the upcoming episodes of Reinventing School. Um, we were just talking about public health as a school subject. And it seems to me that one of the lessons we should have learned or should be learning is that the curriculum as it's set up now, math, science, language arts, et cetera, seems like the wrong curriculum. It seems to me that the right curriculum would begin with your body, and then after that, your mind. And then after that, your your family, your community. I, 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 it's inconceivable to me why we're doing it the way we've been doing it in the 20th century. We all really need to understand. We shouldn't have to explain the idea of a mask, a droplet, a virus. And I should not at this age with the amount of reading that I've done in my life, I shouldn't look at three noted scientists and experts saying, what's a virus? Because I don't know. And if I don't know, I have a feeling a lot of other people don't know either. So we're concerned about people not wearing masks. I don't think they understand why. Like, I think we get the most basic level, but like, how do you go about educating? And I'm, I'm giving you the magic wand. You can redesign the entire K through 12, pre-K if you want. You can take over Sesame Street, whatever you want. How do we do this the right way? Or is it, or do we just, when the battle comes, go fight it? And we don't have to do it because we've been doing fine. Doesn't look like we've been doing fine to me. So I haven't thought about it till you t tossed it out. And the first thing that came to me is I didn't have health class when I was in high school. We did not have health class back then, but my son had health class, not till maybe junior year in high school, but it certainly could be addressed there. I mean, one question is a lot of these issues fall more into social studies than biology. Because and of I don't the history? Know yes. I, I don't. Gonna, okay. Do you realize um, how much history has been affected by infectious disease, including many, many wars, which were totally changed because of infectious disease? Canada would be part of the United States today if it wasn't for smallpox. <laughs> but the and, U.S. And it Army. Turned out the United States ends up. We all moved to Canada anyway. Well, that's another that's story. That's but <laughs> but uh, I mean, the United States Army had to stop its advance because of a smallpox infection. Um, 
back in like I think 76 or 77, 1776, 77. But this But happened. history is yeah. not the place to be teaching this. Kindergarten is the place to be teaching this, I think. And every year after that, am I am I complete? Am I on another planet here? Because it seems to me we have a really bad pandemic and we don't know what the heck we're doing. So I, I think um, definitely um, Stephen um, brings up an interesting point, which is that some of this isn't, we, we define things as very strictly, this is biology, this is chemistry, this is, you know, another subject, but all of these things are intertwined. These are inter interdisciplinary problems. And, and when you think about public health, um, it's, it is interdisciplinary. You need to understand immunology and microbiology, but you also need to understand the role of socioeconomics or, you know, how does poverty play a role? Um, how does um, being educated play a role in um, your development of a disease? And all of these things are um, intertwined. So the, the factors um, that predispose a person to, um, becoming infected might be that they're less educated, that they live in a very crowded environment where, um, you know, they're around a lot of people and they have poor ventilation systems. Um, so there are- And food deserts. And, right, and food deserts. So there's a, there's a lot of societal issues that impact health. And um, one of the biggest challenges I faced when I was a public health official was trying to get legislators or people to understand that to say you know you're wor you're worried about you know this tiny piece which is called health care but you know that's like 10 to 20 percent of what determines a person's health the rest um you know a little of that's genetic but a lot of it's our environment um and where we live work and play how educated we are um no, you know that's been prove with this over and over in terms of what zip codes uh, people got, high percentages of people got sick and people died versus within the same city, and I'm thinking of New York, the same city, even the same borough, another zip code, uh, very low levels of infection and very, very low mor mortality rates. So let me, let me see if I can insert a, a bit of optimism as we're redesigning the world. Um, so one of the really delightful parts of the past few years is I've been all over the world interviewing kids. And I happen to, and usually I'll interview kids who are kind of nine to 15, nine to 14, because they can tell a story and put ideas together. And there's the seven-year-old. And she's like, I really want to tell them. I'm like, okay, that's fine. I'm not going to say no. Um, so she explains that, I said, what do you want? Do you know what you want to be when you go? I want to be a doctor. Um, I'm like, do you have a sense of what kind of doctor? She said, yeah, absolutely. I want a, a pediatrician, probably with a specialty in surgery. Like, wait, you're seven? I'm not sure I would have been able to put those words. Okay. I said, is there a reason? And she's speaking in Bulgarian to me and has just scolded me because I'm not, because I didn't call her Bulgarian. I was asking whether she was gypsy or Roma. She's like, I live in Bulgaria. I speak Bulgarian. I am Bulgarian. Yes. Okay. So a lot of strong sense of identity as well. So she had an infection at about age six. By the time she, and I guess she was just turning seven, she went to the pediatrician in this tiny village. So it was amazing because the village was near nowhere um, that there was a pediatrician, but somebody had actually moved in pediatrician. And she had a sonogram machine. And this uh, girl, Bodhisattva, I think her name was, um, saw the inside of her body in, uh, on the sonogram and was completely overwhelmed. And that was the point of the decision. She lived, lived certainly long enough to allow me to interview her. So I went back and I went, when would a small village in Bulgaria have had a sonogram machine? And what is the likelihood that a pediatrician would have been in that village at that time? And how is it that she diagnosed this particular infection? And this supports what you're saying. It's because the infection was common among that population. So she knew what to look for and the equipment was there. And now this girl at seven years old will advance the cause. It's called progress, right? 
And, and I saw it right before my eyes and it was just thrilling. And in fact, the video is still up online so people can have a look at it. Um, so it's not as if the kids are not curious about this. It's not as if they don't want to learn. They do want to learn. They're seeing people who are dying. They're hearing the stories all the time. And we're teaching them something different from this. So how do we, what do we, who do I need to call? Right. What do we need to do as a group of people who care about this to change schools so this does become a priority? And if we lose the causes of the Mexican-American War, I think I'm OK with that because something's got to go. You can't just keep putting new stuff on the shelves. So how important is this or is it something that the scientists and medical professionals will simply take care of? We don't need to know that much. Can we just get it from the news? Because clearly it's going to be the news or classroom that we're getting it from. How do we put this together the best way? So if I could just weigh in, I, I love the way that this conversation is going because I really concur with all of this, right? And if we don't do a good job in motivating and inspiring and educating kids, not even necessarily kids that are going to turn into physicians, but just that are going to turn into informed healthcare consumers, they then become the adults that might refuse to take vaccines or adults that don't understand the importance of wearing masks. So this education is not just about growing the educational potential, but it has a direct then impact on the ability, for example, of pathogens, things that cause disease to spread among populations. And, and I, I'm loath to look at anything as a silver lining to this pandemic. I mean, we've had 38 million people in the world that have gotten infected, over a million of whom have died, 200,000 plus in the United States alone. This is truly uh, a, a disaster. But it may actually change how we think about educating about epidemiology and viruses and, and education writ large regarding science. I think we tend to teach science the way we teach reading, you need to know your letters before you know your words, words before sentences. And therefore, the way we teach science is very much foundational. And then you build on that level by level. But you can't teach a kid in kindergarten or first grade about RNA and DNA viruses because that's going to be a mystery to them. You can teach them about why some people get sick and how, uh, how individuals get sick from other individuals. And starting with the stories to Steve's point, how they've influenced history, to the successes that Tista's pointed out as far as um, just making differences as far as clean water or reducing mosquito populations are probably doorways into understanding um, this topic that are gonna be much more accessible and much more impactful. There are plenty of time down the road for them to know about RNA and DNA viruses, but more importantly, to understand how it impacts our lives as humans. And, and how we impact each other. Yep. So one of my areas of interest is type two diabetes because it, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong here or really off base. It seems to be one of the only major killers that we can simply decide as individuals not to participate in because of diet and exercise. We're not going to wipe out everybody, but if we made a tremendous improvement by educating the masses, the obese masses, the, the masses that are, right? So if we could make a major dent in that, I, a partner and I did some calculating. We realized we could basically pay teacher salaries for the entire year, give everybody a good bump, and rebuild all of the public schools in the United States every 10 years. We're talking about that much money that we spend on this. Now, discount it. Maybe it's Maybe we can only rebuild the schools every 20 years instead of every 10. Maybe I'm wrong by a bit. But does public education, does that educated kindergartner, first grader, seventh grader, and all that, is that person less likely to contract and sort of have their body support diabetes? Or, is educa or, or are we just applying the wrong tool to the problem? And I'm going to expand this to masks and all that in a minute. I'm, I'm actually going to disagree a little because... Yeah, I mean, you can tell people all you want, stay away from certain foods and exercise and don't smoke. Yeah. Um, but I have to walk into this building, uh, I have to walk by all the smokers from the VA hospital who figured out where they are allowed to smoke. Um, 
even what 50 years after the Surgeon General's warning, um, it's hard to teach people these things. I mean, but I don't care about those 22 smokers. I care about everybody. If they, if it's a but tiny it's, minority, okay. But are we, is, does education actually get to the result we want for most people? We're not going to get everybody. So does it work? I would say there's their education is, is a piece, um, but um, there's got to be a lot of other components. So not being obese or being obese as a child um, increases your likelihood of being obese as an adult. And that leads to type two diabetes. So, you know, having a child who's not obese is, is ideal. Um, but we can't just teach people, you know, whether it's a kindergartner or even their mom, um, you know, eat healthy. We have to enable, um, create systems around them so that that's, that's the healthy choice is the easy choice. So for example, you know, if you, if you're only making a minimum wage and you have to feed your whole family and going to whole foods, you can buy an apple for the amount that you could buy, uh, you know, Big Macs for your entire yeah. family and feed them. Um, you're going to probably choose the Big Macs. Um, All right, but so take the economic piece and put it aside for a second. Assuming, uh, let's just work with the people who do have enough money to make the decisions, which is going to be a big chunk, more than 50%, right? Um, do, my question is a different one. If you do educate people, do they behave differently? I know that's a big question. Well, yes. So let's look at the AIDS epidemic as an example. Right. One of the things that helped to mitigate that particular epidemic or pandemic, if you want to accept my belief that that was also a, a pandemic, was education about safe sex practices, for example. Right? And people listened. Um, and as a consequence, that helped. It didn't eliminate the virus, but it certainly changed behaviors. And that was all predicated on uh, useful, thoughtful, aggressive education campaigns. So... Yes, I mean, I certainly think we all make decisions about our own health based on a variety of influences, some of which are what the scientists, what physicians might have to say, but some of them are, you know, if I want to eat that donut, I'm just going to go ahead and eat that donut, or I'm going to succumb to peer pressure from my community that says, don't vaccinate your kid. None of us have. Why should you? So there are lots and lots of factors, but I don't think that that negates the power of thoughtful and early education about how to take care of yourself. Yeah, and, and I think thoughtful and early education can lead to culture change. So if I, if I think about my childhood, I don't remember wearing a seatbelt ever. Yeah, me either. Um, <laughs> and yet like now, it, my, if I get into a car, my kids immediately will tell you, or whoever's in the car, to put their seatbelt on. It's... it's um, yeah, it's also it's also the the way that we build cars. They have that annoying sound that tell you to put your seatbelt on. You can ignore it, but it it's really annoying. Yeah, but you said something really important. You said your kids would say put your seatbelts on. Yes. Right. It's funny how that influence going from bottom up. So do we have kids who are saying, Mom, Dad, wear the mask. Don't go out without a mask. In other words, is there a higher value in educating young and then constantly reinforcing it because i mean we have a assuming that the mask is the silver bullet you got to be out you got to wear a mask let's just for the moment let's assume that's the solution educating kids to do that and to impress it on their families seems to me to be a more powerful way of thinking about this than getting the parents to do it and put it on their kids just based on my work with families don't know if i'm right or not but clearly we got a problem and we're not changing the behavior. And I wonder whether aiming this at the right audience, maybe that's what schools are for, but I don't know. That, that doubtful. sounds really good, except oh, I'm not supposed to get into politics, huh? And who would have thought that masks would get us into politics, but you yeah. have some fairly loud people saying masks are bad. They don't help. You don't need to wear them. Yeah. But those people, let's say one of them might be old, right? 
So what happens if it's a younger, I don't know. So let me ask the question a bit more broadly. There are all of these schools. There are 100,000 public schools in the United States. There are 50, more than 50 million kids who are going to those schools. And a lot of them are scared. Um, when we started talking in our school district, it was going to be, well, the kids will be three feet from each other, even though it says six feet, we know better. So we're going to do six, uh, three feet. And somehow six feet became sort of the magical thing. But if you sneeze or speak loudly, whatever it is you're sending in the air, I think you're going further than six feet. And I think it kind of stays there, particularly if the room is kind of closed. So if I'm a parent trying to make a decision about whether or not my kid should be in school, knowing that the kids are going to take the masks off to eat and for other purposes, and that there's always kids in the school who can't or won't wear masks, are we dealing here with don't worry about it? Or are we dealing here with, yeah, worry about it, keep the kids home? Like, where are we on that spectrum? So, uh, you know, I would say that we've, we're learning a lot and um, you're absolutely right um, about both ventilation and mask wearing. Uh, kids don't necessarily stick to mask wearing, but we are, have learned from other countries that it is possible to reopen schools safely if there, there's really two things that have to happen. One is you have to have relatively low rates of the virus circulating in the community because the more virus there is in the community, the greater the odds are it will enter your school. So, you know, you have to make sure that's low first before you reopen. What's second, low? I mean, is there a, a number for low? I wish there was a magic number for low. Um, but, you know, in every government, because this has been such a patchwork approach, everybody has different numbers and different, uh, you know, benchmarks. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, as low as, as, as you could hopefully get it, um, you know, I think the lower the amount of viruses in your community, the less chances that a, a kid will show up there on day one um, with, with the virus and then give it to others. So that was the, one. That yeah. was the one. The second is how well the school can actually adhere to preventive measures. And um, there was a, a report out uh, in June by the government accountability organization that looked at HVAC systems in schools. And they thought over 41% of districts in school um, districts across the country had inadequate HVAC systems, which means that the ventilation is poor and which makes mask wearing extremely important, but kids have to eat lunch. Um, so, you know, being able to enforce mask wearing, the social distancing, there is no magic six foot number. I think that's just a, you know, kind of an arbitrary determination. Greater than six feet would be ideal, but you know, six feet is, is I guess, a minimum that someone set. Um, that said, I think, you know, keeping kids apart, having less crowding, um, you know, finding a way so that, that there's more distance between them. Um, and, and creating ventilation is important. My daughter uh, is uh, in, in third grade and her school is, was doing outdoor classrooms um, and quite successfully was open, um, have, has been open for about eight weeks. Um, whereas my son's school is um, not able to do that for whatever reason, and they have very old HVAC systems and mask wearing is hit or miss. Um, so we're, you know, he's staying remote. In you the know, US, more than half the schools are over a half century old. Yeah, which Just means they don't have an HVAC system. They have radiators. Right. There is no yeah. air circulation. There's just air heating. Right. Right. This Which is makes it a particular pleasure if you're in Philadelphia public schools in West Philly. Uh, and I spent a bunch of time in them because not only is there no circulation and often the windows don't open properly and you have radiators, but also you can't necessarily hear the teacher unless you're standing in the, unless you're sitting in the first two rows. So we have some work to do in school design. I'm glad I cut you off. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was just going to add to this point that I think 
it's a matter of each of us figuring out, not just with, re with respect to whether kids return to schools or teachers return to schools, but even with regard to our own behaviors. It's a matter of evaluating your comfort level with risk and knowing what the different risk factors that might be that weigh into an individual choice, right? I mean, to have a, a nationwide conversation about whether it's safe to return to schools is probably silly because there are schools in the South that can stay, can have outdoor classes longer than schools that are up in Michigan and Minnesota. Differences based on age, kindergartners are gonna be less compliant with masks than let's say seventh, eighth, ninth graders, one would presume how old your school system and how well the air circulates, what their testing strategies are. And even if you know all of that, rational people might come up with different decisions with the same, the same information. Somebody but rational might... people are, like me are very poorly informed. So right. I can be as rational as you like. I don't know what I'm talking about. So how, why am I being allowed to make this decision? I mean, I understand and free country, but Really? Because if I'm looking around a group of people who ought to be talking about this, I'm not in that room. Right. Well, this I, is, I, I won't get political, but I do think when we think about if we were to do this again, how would we do things differently? It isn't just about more testing and, and being more candid and straightforward. It is also having those exact conversations, Howie, as far as what kinds of risks should you at least factor into the decisions that you ultimately make about your, your behaviors? I want to, I want to add a range of not... possibilities, but they're, they're going to be dictated. Yes. They're going to be, you, you need to be educated about what those factors might be. I want to add, we're not there in testing yet. Um, I know several people recently in, in Syracuse, including the family of an infectious disease uh, a professor, who wanted to get his kids tested, who had um, something going on, respiratory going on over this past weekend and could not find a place where he could get a result within four or five days where, so that he could find out if they could go to school this week. Um, tonight, all right, so tonight is the big school board meeting in our district and they want to try to make a decision about whether to stay with half the school comes in on Mondays and Tuesdays, Wednesday, they super clean the school, whatever that means. And then Thursday, Friday, the other, and they would like to go to five days a week. They're comparing their local board of health, county board of health um, advice with CDC advice. And I keep thinking there's a third track, which is, do we really know what we're talking about? And why are we doing an experiment in real time without having the appropriate controls for an experiment? So, if you were to advise this school board about how to think about this and how to resolve the issue tonight, they're allowed to table it, but what are the decision factors? So Glenn, I'll take you first. So I think that we have made, hmm, let's see. I think that we have made decisions about, for example, the six feet. I, I think these are well-intentioned individuals that say to themselves, you know, six feet, that feels about right. Is something happen magically at six feet versus five and a half feet? Certainly not, right? But these are well-intentioned individuals that at the beginning of this pandemic were making decisions that seemed reasonable in the moment. Remember at the very beginning of the pandemic, we were actually advised not to wear masks with the goal of saving them for healthcare workers. A, a, a decision that back then made some sense because they were in fact quite limiting. Where we are now, six, eight months into this pandemic, is we know much, much more about how this virus is transmitted, about what the potential risk factors are for this, and therefore making decisions. I mean, the, I, I got to say, the Wednesday super clean doesn't do very much for me. If you actually just put this virus on a table and you waited a couple days, guess what? You're going to come back and it's going to fall apart. That coat that I talked about at the very beginning of the hour falls apart fairly easily for this virus. So, you know, to invest money in guys that come in with sprayers and scrubbing the undersides of desks is a complete waste of energy and time. It sounds right to parents that may have optical benefit, but it certainly is not going to improve um, the safety of those kids. Anchoring those decisions in good science and having the scientists that can be present to say, this is valid stuff. These are the, these are the, the, the findings upon which you base your decision as to whether kids can come back one, five, three days, 
um, that feels like the right step to, to make as opposed to the well-intentioned folks that are going to meet tonight. Okay, but you're advising them. Are you telling them to go with the half the kids, that part of the week, half the kids, this part of the week, or just bring everybody in, don't worry about it? My own personal opinion, I'll be very interested to see um, what my colleagues here think. I don't feel that you are reducing much by way of risk by having the half and half. Because this presumes that these kids don't see each other after, after school, that they don't play together outside. It's a matter of behaviors, not just within the defined school day, but do they have birthday parties and do they, the Monday, Tuesday kid, invite the Thursday, Friday friends over to their birthday parties? I don't think that you're providing that much greater security by dividing the kids in half. I understand so, it from an optics perspective, but not scientifically. So five days a week or just keep everybody home? It depends on where you are. And, and to Tista's point, exactly. It is what's the level of virus within your community? If it is at rates moderate, that, yeah, no, I know what it is up in Bucks, yeah, right? Right. If it's if it is moderate, if it if it is not on the increase, then you can bring the. Well, I don't want to say you can bring those kids back safely because there is, of course, going to be substantial risk, and that risk then has consequences not just for those kids, but for the teachers and for everybody else that's within their you know personal orbit. So I don't want to way in because I think that would be on my part as a basic scientist kind of naive, but I certainly don't see that there is that much better risk or, or better safety with two days versus five. All right, Tista, what do you think? So I, I, I would have to agree with a lot of what Glenn said. I think um, the cleaning, um, we've, we've learned since the virus started that, that while that's a, the, you know, surfaces, surfaces and contact with dirty surfaces can certainly uh, be a pathway to infection, it's really less common than the, the droplets in the air and the aerosols that we create when we talk or, or sing or, you know, hang out with other people. And so I think the, the bigger um, place to consider infection control is in both the, the ventilation, the air. Um, so, you know, is the school does it have a decent air HVAC system? That's more important to me than whether there's, you know, you know, five days a week or, or so two. So if it doesn't, then the kids shouldn't go to the school? How do you measure that? So what I would say is capitalize on the weather. What we have found so far is that most um, infection transmission seems to occur indoors. Um, so, so capitalize on the outdoors. If that means modifying your calendar, Modify your calendar. I mean, we have to be creative here, but um, you know, think about ways where you can have school when you can have the windows open. And um, you know, winter is going to be tough in uh, cold weather states because what we've seen so far is that because indoor transmission seems to drive this a lot, um, the warm weather states, the Sun Belt states when it was too hot to be outside, they were all inside in air conditioning and we saw a huge surge in the summertime. We're gonna see the reverse um, in the Northern states. So sending our kids back to school in poorly ventilated buildings with the windows closed, knowing that they probably won't wear masks most of the time or some of the time um, during the winter might not be the smartest way to go. Maybe that's when you go remote. And then you, ex, you know, change the calendar a bit and, and, and enable them to have more in-person learning in warmer months. Stephen, help. You're the last word. Well, uh, two, two thoughts here. One is, I don't know what the air exchange really is and whether there's any filtration. I mean, some sort of way to actually remove virus as opposed to just blowing it around. Um, you know, in 1918, these all, I live in a 100-year-old house. Um, it, it has been changed, but at one point it probably had a radiator under each window. And at night in 1924 or five, they probably left the windows open even in Syracuse with the heat up high because that was thought as a way to prevent uh, respiratory infections uh, with a big furnace downstairs burning coal. Um, the, um, I agree, it depends on where you are a lot. It depends on both the weather, I, I hadn't even thought about the, the flip thing, but you know, people don't have to be work off in the summer to get the crops in. Um, they, they could be off in the middle of the winter 
uh, though the parents would have to figure out what to do with a kid in the middle of the winter. Um, but the other, th the only reason I, I think the split schedule might help is just to reduce the density. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of schools are packed, uh, 30, 35, even 40 kids in a classroom and, and a split day or a split schedule um, is, uh, I think, a way to get that classroom size down to 20. Actually, I did the research. The average number of students per classroom in the United States is 23. Now, that means there's more and less, right? But I was surprised that the average hit that I would have thought it was more like 30 or so. So there are places where it is. But I think we've already done that reduction. I think it's just been the system has reduced the number yeah. of kids per classroom. And, and I, I want to agree with, uh, and, and in fact, I, I sent you a, uh, an article from the time. Oh, well, actually, I think this is someone else. It was an article in the Times today uh, about how uh, we don't really need to clean everything anymore. Uh, that um, that was the thought back in uh, March that we had a scrub. Um, and uh, now... Um, we, we've realized it doesn't spread that way. And if it did, the ATM would be the super spreader, not yeah. uh, uh, the, the wedding and, and uh, the big bar mitzvah or whatever <laughs> the, the deal yeah. is where you get a lot of people together. Uh, and we know it's getting people together that's the big spreader. So the school worries me a bit. I think it depends on what the ratio, uh, what the case mm -hmm. rate is in your area. Uh, we have rural, we have school districts in central New York. It was in the news this morning that have not had a single case. Yeah, um, they can be open five days a week. But That's why it now costs seven times as much to buy a house in your neighborhood that it did before, right? Yeah, um, every we've had a number of people from New York City moving up, working remotely from their new house in Syracuse. Right, exactly. Well, any other thoughts? Because we've covered a lot of territory, and I'm really grateful. Um, for all of your ideas and the way we've kind of put it together. So anything else we want to hit before we do, or should I just say thank you to all of you? I, I would just say one more thing, which is the, the density piece for um, those schools that do have the overcrowding issue um, would be important. So, you know, distance from each other um, does matter because, you know, crowded settings create more opportunity for viral spread. But, you know, if, if you're in a small school where that's not an issue, um, then you know you need, you really need to pay attention to other things like like ventilation and masks. Glenn, my only final point, and it may not be even re relevant to this conversation, but I try and make it as often as I can, is that what will end this pandemic is when we reach a threshold of enough of us who have immunity. And that surely will not be, let's pray that it's not going to be because all of us have gotten infected. The vaccines that are on their way are going to be the way in which we see our way clear to this. And I understand the anxiety about people taking those vaccines and are they being rushed and are they safe and are we ready for them? Um, that's going to be the main story of 2021. And it is to encourage folks to say, let me at least do the, my research to determine whether I want to get vaccinated. I'm very enthusiastic about the quality and the safety of these vaccines and would hope that people make the decision to get there because that is, as a community, how we get past this. Very good. A very good way to, to end it. Thank you all. Please hang out for a minute after the credits, but we're going to roll the credits now. demand episodes and more visit our website kids on earth contains hundreds of video interviews with students from around the world learning revolution is a global collaboration network for people who care about learning be sure to join us next thursday for a new episode of reinventing school thanks for watching